Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we are going to talk about electrons and light, which is chapter 13, section 3. So, what do we know about light and atomic spectra? Up until the 17th century, our understanding of light was very limited, um, and in the time of Isaac Newton, which would be the 17th century, uh, people thought that light consisted of particles, but by 1900, most scientists really believed that light was made up of waves. So what is the wave description of light? Well, we're talking about electromagnetic radiation. That's defined as the form of energy that exhibits wave-like behavior as it travels through space. Um, and it's all the forms of electromagnetic radiation. And it turns out that electromagnetic radiation travels at a constant speed. So all forms of electromagnetic radiation travel at a constant speed given the symbol C, and C is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So that's the speed of light. So when we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, we're talking about everything from gamma rays with wavelengths of 10 to the minus 14th, to shortwave radio, which is 10 to the 4th, and again, these are meters, and this little sliver in the section is the visible region of light. That's what we can perceive with our eyes, and it's giving you the wavelength here in nanometers. Visible light goes from violet at about 400-ish to uh, red at about 700 nanometers. So what are some properties of waves? We talk about the height of a wave above the origin as the amplitude. We talk about the distance between two adjacent waves, the crests, is called the wavelength. We use the Greek letter lambda, and the unit is meters. For frequency, which is the number of wave cycles that pass a given point per unit time. So the unit here is inverse seconds. And another Greek letter, frequency is given the symbol nu. It's a Greek letter, looks kind of like a V. And frequency and wavelength are inversely related. So the greater the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the shorter the frequency. So let's look at what a picture of a wave looks like. So this line would be the amplitude and the portion of the wave above the origin is the crest. That below is a trough. A complete wavelength is a complete cycle. Wavelength is measured by definition from crest to crest, so that's the wavelength. And as I said, the frequency has the unit of inverse seconds or wave cycles per second. So according to this wave model of light, the speed of light, C, is equal to lambda times nu. So the speed of light in meters per second is equal to the wavelength in meters, and that's lambda, times the frequency, that's nu, in cycles per second. And the speed is a constant 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So sunlight is a continuous range of wavelengths and frequencies. So when we're seeing a sunlight, we're seeing all of the various wavelengths. And a prism will separate sunlight into its individual wavelengths. And so that's what we're seeing when we see a rainbow. We're seeing that effect of all of the different uh, wavelengths and frequencies of light being separated out. And each color that we see in a rainbow has a specific wavelength and frequency, where red is the longest uh, wavelength and the shortest or lowest frequency, and blue is the highest frequency and the shortest wavelength. So scientists knew that gaseous elements emit light when they absorb energy, and neon lights are an example of that. And they figured that atoms are absorbing energy and losing it and emitting light. So if the light is passed through a prism, they were able to observe something called an atomic emission spectrum. And scientists in the 1800s were able to observe this, and they were able to observe the atomic emission spectra and knew that different elements had different spectra. So scientists tried to explain these spectra that they were observing, and they were trying to use that um, 
what they knew about atoms at this point to understand why they were seeing these line emission spectra. And so they observed that the atomic emission spectra are not continuous like sunlight. Um, they have lines, and each line represents a distinct frequency and wavelength, and they knew that every element has a unique emission spectrum. So scientists had observed something called the photoelectric effect, and it was the emission of a stream of light, electrons, from a metal when light shines on it. And what they observed was that it took a specific frequency of light to make each metal eject a photoelectron, or eject light. And the wave model would predict that any light, any frequency, should cause the same effect in metals. And it was not the case. And so it didn't fit the wave model. And scientists were trying to figure out what was going on with this photoelectric effect. So this right here are two illustrations of the photoelectric effect. And basically, this is some metal, copper or silver or gold or whatever. And what scientists observed is that if you shone light on the surface, eventually you would hit the right wavelength to cause the metal to spew these this stream of light. And different colors of light would make different uh, metal elements spew these electrons. And it was called the photoelectric effect. And a lot of people were trying to figure out how that fit with what they knew about atoms. So this fellow, Max Planck, proposed that objects emit energy in small discrete packets that he called quanta. And a quantum of energy is the minimum quantity of energy that can be gained or lost by an atom. And so he proposed the following relationship that E, the energy, is equal to some constant times the frequency. And again, he was trying to explain this photoelectric effect. So he said that the energy of a body changes only in small discrete units, and the amount of energy is directly proportional to the frequency. And again, that's Max Planck. So the energy of an individual photon is directly proportional to its frequency. E equals H times frequency. Energy is equal to H is given the name Planck's constant and nu is the frequency. And h has a value of 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. And joules is an energy unit, and seconds is time. So photons with greater frequency have greater energy. So in 1905, Albert Einstein expanded Planck's theory by introducing the idea that electromagnetic radiation actually behaves as both a wave and a particle. And it was called particle wave duality. And he said that light can be considered as a stream of particles that he called photons, again, short for photoelectrons. And a photon is a particle of electromagnetic radiation having a zero mass and carrying this quantum of energy. So Einstein was able to explain the photoelectric effect. And he said that electromagnetic radiation is absorbed by matter only in these whole number units of photons. And in order for an electron to be ejected from the surface of a metal, for instance, the electron must be struck by a photon that had at least that minimum energy required to knock it loose. And again, the energy of a photon is equal to h Planck's constant times frequency. And again, Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second. And if you're talking about electrons, the fact that it's such a small quantity should not be surprising. So when light shines on metals, they emit electrons that we're calling photoelectrons. And it takes this specific frequency of light to make a metal eject a photoelectron. So Einstein proposed that light can be described as a quantum of energy, or plural quanta of energy, uh, made up of these photoelectrons that behave as little particles. 
and the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921 was awarded to Albert Einstein for his services to theoretical physics, and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. So most people don't realize that the Nobel Prize that Einstein won was for explaining the photoelectric effect, not for general relativity. And so the classical mechanics that we've been talking about up to this point predict the motion of very large bodies. Um, and when we're talking about quantum mechanics, which is the atom world, uh, we're talking about subatomic particles. And so quantum mechanics is really concerned with these very, very small quantities. So if you're talking about a car, it's pretty easy to know where it is and how fast it's going. But when you're talking about subatomic particles, there's a bit more uncertainty. And it turns out that a man by the name of Heisenberg pointed out that you cannot know the position of an electron and how fast it's going at the same time. So again, it seems like an oddity because we're used to knowing, like for instance, cars and baseballs. But in the subatomic world, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that you can't know where something is and how fast it's going. And again, we're talking about electrons. So for now, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.